morning. Wow. <clears throat> scared myself. <laughs> Mufasa. Ooh, say it again. <laughs> it is one of those fun things. Uh, I actually was told once that I sounded like Bane. I don't know about that, but um, do you feel me? a good start. Uh, glad to be with you today. I've got a very little bit of time to cover a lot of ground, um, and so I'm just going to get into it. My name is Leonce. Uh, I actually have four children now. Uh, that's what happens when you take your wife on vacation. Uh, you come back, <laughs> you come back with surprises, and uh, so we need to get that bio updated. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I am grateful. I am grateful for the goodness of God, and, um, and I'm just going to ask you today to uh, help me preach just a little bit. Now, I don't know what kind of community this is, uh, but my second job is to teach my Caucasian brothers and sisters how, there it is, uh, how to properly listen to a sermon. And so for the bold among you, if you want to shout amen, that's all right. That's advanced. That's, uh, that's a level three move there. Um, but if you want to start down here with a deacon hum, just, mm, just a, you know, uh, level two would be a my, my, you know, just... You just let those things come to you as they would. I don't know if you got a Bible with you, but we're going to be in Luke uh, chapter 15 today. And I'm going to tell you a very familiar story, hopefully in an unfamiliar way. And uh, man, that song directly connects to this, the one we just sang. And so we'll pray for God's grace to light it up. I'm going to read just verse 20 to get us started. And then I'm going to pray and then we'll go to work. Luke chapter 15 verse 20, but while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Pray for me. I'm going to pray for you, and then uh, we'll see what we can do with the next 25 minutes or so. Father, grant us the grace now of hearing with clarity. Uh, I pray now. That for those of us who are here and are skeptical, and we are here, suspend our skepticism. For those of us who are hurting, bind up our wounds. For those of us who are confused, give us clarity. For those of us who sorrow, give us joy. And for all who are gathered, let us see you face to face this morning. Show us your glory, we ask, Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and all the free people said, Amen. There are many lenses through which we might view God, and we often get him wrong. I'm first in that line. For some of us, this lens is theology alone, meaning that God becomes a subject of our study, uh, a figure to read about and be learned, an object of our intellectual affection. For others, God is seen as a distant deity. This was my struggle for many, many years. He wound up the clock of the world, as it were, and took a step back to see what would happen, largely leaving us to our own devices. Many of us tend to see God as an angry judge, adjudicating the failures and events of our lives, but having little to do with our day-to-day -day reality. And still others see God as a transactional being, a genie granting wishes, making sure that our needs are met as long as we are doing the right thing by him. In fact, with enough faith and good behavior, you can ask God for anything, and he simply has to respond. But the most common lens, and the one that I struggle with the most myself, is one that sees God as limited in his benevolence 
and limited in his love. It is a lens that constrains us to seeing God as too good, too distant, too demanding to tolerate our shortcomings. It is a lens that limits the love of God to the degree that we think even his compassions has limitations. It is limited to the lovable, limited to the good, limited to the obedient, limited to those who can always get it right and always have the right answer. Limited to the list of sins that we deem forgivable, but never enough to cover me. And Because any one of these lenses we often struggle to believe that God can actually love us. In fact, I would go so far as to say that everything that we've ever done that would be against the will of God is because we don't believe that the love of God is enough to cover us. But that's just not true. In fact, Jesus encourages us to hear in this simple parable that we are also familiar with that the Father's compassion is, in fact, limitless, that God is a Father, a Father who seeks, who never turns away. His compassion is inexhaustible, and His love is especially poured out on those who feel unlovable. That's where you would say amen. There we go. Boy, it's going to be hard going this morning. And so before us today is one of the most complex and beautiful stories, I believe, that has ever been told. It has been painted by many, most notably Rembrandt. It has been the subject of plays and movies. And much like a piece of extraordinary music, it has several movements, each key to understanding exactly what it is that Jesus is on about. And that is for us to see God in his character as a loving father. This parable is each before it has context, and it is a part of a series of stories that Jesus tells to make a point. And so, though we're going to be looking primarily starting in verse 11, the context uh, is back in verse 1 of this chapter. And it says that all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. Now, I don't know what you're studying in school right now, but I would encourage you not to join the IRS because they are in fact separate from other sinners. Um, I'm just reading the Bible. What is right there in the text? The tax collectors and sent like what? Wow, you got your own category. Um, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, that was Jesus' M.O., he had a nearly endless stream of the rejected around him at all times. At all times, he was with people who existed on the margins, with the poor, with prostitutes, with the wealthy who took advantage of others. He was always surrounded by those that the religious deemed not good enough. And this upset the religious folk. This upset them because they believed that there was a certain set of things that you had to do, a certain set of rules that you had to play by, a certain distance from your worst behavior before you were deemed good enough. And so it's for this reason that Jesus tells a triplet of parables about lost things. And I tell you that in hopes that you'll go back and read these things for yourself. First, a lost sheep, and then a lost coin, and finally a story about two, two, there's the twist in the story, two lost sons. In verse 11, Luke tells us that Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them <clears throat> said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. Now, <clears throat> the offense of this may be lost on us. It's not lost on me, but it may be lost on some of us because in a society that is virtually free of any cultural or societal expectations, our society, then it would not be totally understandable how horrible this was for this young man to ask for his inheritance 
early. And so it may not seem as weighty to us as it would have been in this culture of honor. But in Jesus' time and culture, this would have been nothing less than shameful. In fact, many scholars believe that it would have been akin to wishing his father were dead to demand before his father's death that which would be bequeathed to him after his father's death. Now, you heard me say this earlier. I have four children. And if one of them came up to me and said, hey, before you kick the bucket, if you could just, you know, cut a brother a check for what's going to be mine. That's a quick way to... I still got these hands. I'm saved, but you can still get these hands. Just a side note. If you don't understand what I'm saying because you're a faculty member, pull a student aside and say, well, what did he mean by get these hands? And just, they'll tell you. They'll tell you. But here was the boy's problem. He wanted the father's blessing, but not the father. That's not unfamiliar, is it? He wanted the father's blessing, but not the father. There's dual shame in this. Of course, because by asking for a third, a third of all that his father owned, he would be immediately cutting into his father's livelihood. Not only that, but it forces his father to parse out the inheritance to his eldest son as well, though no such request has been made. And yet here at the outset of this story, the father shows the great love and compassion he has for his son. Because even though the son essentially wishes him dead in order to collect his material wealth from him, the father did not even balk. He simply fulfilled his request. A few days later, Verse 13 tells us the boy gathered up all that he had and he traveled to a distant country and there he squandered his property in, I love this phrase here, dissolute living. What it's actually saying there is that he went to a foreign land and got it popping. That's the translation. He spent everything that he had. He made it rain. He surrounded himself with only dime pieces until he was out of money. It's exactly what took place there. When he had spent everything, all of a sudden a severe famine came on to the country and he found himself in incredible need. And so what did he do? He said that he went, left with no money and with little food, but full of pride. And he believed that somehow he could still make it on his own, that somehow he could still provide for himself. Even though he was destitute. Here's a little side note for you. Pride is a most cunning liar. It constantly bids us to depend on no one and do everything on our own terms. And the boy didn't realize this. He had yet to realize the weight of what he's done. So he goes and hires himself out to work among the pigs of a citizen of this faraway place. Now, this is a precarious position for him because he is a Jewish boy and Jews were not even supposed to be around swine. They were not even supposed to be around pigs, let alone eat them. They could not raise them. It was a distinctly in their mind pagan practice. Now, if we shout for no other reason this morning, we need to be shouting for God's grace in giving us bacon. <laughs> because you got to remember that when the sheep came down, Peter had to get him a bite of that ham hock. That's called freedom. Because before the gospel, they could have no bacon. They could only have kosher meals. He was out of place. He was out of position. His position was as a son. His place was in his father's home. But he took himself from under his father's covering and under his father's care in an attempt to fulfill his own will, to try and determine his own way. You need to hear me say that, young folks, that whenever we try and fulfill our own will and determine our own way, we end up starved for what is good and covered in slop. Every single time. Self, 
He realizes the error of what he's done, and he remembers the goodness and compassion of his father. For even the hired hands, he says, eat good at daddy's house. And here I am rolling around with pigs. And so he says to himself, I will get up and I will go to my father. Note the little turn there. This is why words are so important. He doesn't say, I'm going to get up and go to my father's house. He says, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to my father. You see, where he once only saw his father as a means of blessing for him, he now see the relationship with his father as the blessing itself. This was his first step toward reconciliation realizing that he, in fact, was wrong. He prepares what he's going to say. He's going to confess how foolish he was and how hurtful he was. He's going to confess that he sinned against both his father and against the Lord himself. He's going to tell his dad everything that went sideways and repent for the poor stewardship of all that he had acquired, everything that he had blown in dissolute living, and lacking a moral compass. But even within that, he knows something of his father. He knows that his father is compassionate and that his father will welcome him at the very least as a servant. So the young man leaves at once to return home. And then there's a shift in the narrative in verse 20. You see, all the while his son was gone, The father was looking for and longing for and waiting for his return. How do we know this? We read it already. Because when he finally does return, it says, while he was yet far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. I want you to put your imagination caps on for a minute. I know social media and video games have stolen that from us. But put yourself there, under the text, under the text. That every day, every day this old man got up and he walked outside and he squinted through the near eastern sun and he watched the people move about. And he said, is that my son? Is he coming home? No, that's not him. And with a grieved heart, he returns back. And the night goes and the morning comes and he get up before his work starts and, and at his noon break and he goes out and he, and he stands by the roadside and he says, can I, can I see my son? Will today be the day that he returns home to me? And he realizes that it won't be. And he returns home. And every day he'd wait, he'd watch, he'd hope. Perhaps he'd pray that his son would come home. It didn't matter what he had done. It didn't matter where he had gone. It didn't matter what number of offenses he had committed. This was his son. And he simply wanted him home. And so on this fateful day, he, he sees him coming down the road, and, and the father is so elated that he takes off running toward his son. Again, this is where cultural context serves us well. Because back then, they didn't have pumas. They wore Jerusalem cruisers, better known to you all as Birkenstocks. And they wore long, flowing robes. And older men didn't run. But when his boy, when his boy came down the road, I, I, I just see it in my mind's eye. It's like, it, it's like he looked and he saw the, the silhouette of his son and he, and he saw the gait of his walk and he saw the way that he moved and he said, that's my boy. I know this because I have a son and he already walks like me. It's a touch of swag and arrogance that that the spirit is still working out of our generation. He's two years old and he got a little bounce and he just walk around the house like this. And I'm just like, but you're two though. 
And whenever he wants something, he's just starting to talk. And whenever he wants something, he, he just point. I mean, that's my son. And I just imagine that he saw the silhouette of his boy. And he ran up and he embraced his boy and he kissed him. And the boy began to, to go through his confession. He had practiced it. And before he could get a word out, his father said, no, 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 no. I don't need you to tell me everything you've done wrong. I'm just glad to have you home. And then he throws a party. The return of his lost son is met with great celebration, not chiding and hostility. There is a feast. He tells his servants, run, get my boy a robe, put a pinky ring on his finger. We need to give him the sign and the seal of belonging to this family. And they begin to make those preparations. There's a second half of this story here, and we don't have time to unpack it in detail, so I'll be brief. While they were preparing the party for the young man who had returned, it says that the older son was out in the field. And one of the servants runs out to the field and he says, hey, your little brother's back. And you would think that the older brother would be happy and would be excited that, that his younger brother has come back. But instead, he's frustrated and upset. In fact, he refuses to enter the celebration. And just as the father had done for his younger boy, who left home to try and live by his own will, he goes out to his older boy and pleads with him to come in. He initiates reconciliation with both his children, no matter the state of their heart. You see, no matter if we've wandered far from home or stayed close because of duty alone, the Father's compassion, his grace is still the same. And so it reminds the older boy, just because your brother came home doesn't mean you're suddenly displaced by me. Everything that I have is yours. My love for you has not wavered. Won't you please come in? You see, though it is the hope of the father that he would, we don't find out if the eldest son changed course because Jesus abruptly ends the story with the father repeating, that his lost son had returned home. Now, as I said, this is a bit of a complex story, and we certainly went through it more quickly than I would have liked. There's drama, there's familial dysfunction, selfish ambition, and celebration moments and movements that climb dramatically and magnificently to this glorious end. Why did Jesus tell this parable? He told this parable to show his listeners and us what God is like. Did you hear what I said? That's the most important thing you will ever hear. It shows us what God is like. You see, I didn't grow up as many of you did, even as my wife did. I make fun of my wife all the time. She went from womb to homeschool to Christian college to married to a pastor. She was on the Jesus Plan 101. What she didn't know is that she was going to marry a pastor that had been in them streets. And that wasn't my story. No, I went from womb to public school to selling drugs to fighting every day to realizing that. Because that is what the father is like. So the question is, who are you today? Are you wild and wandering? Oh, you're on a Christian campus, but you know who you really are. 
In fact, Christian school is the most dangerous place for Christians sometimes because it's easy to hide behind activity and have a heart that is cold and dead and working in the field because of duty alone. Are you wild and wandering or are you, are you the older brother and you serve God because it's the right thing to do? No matter which you would consider yourself, the father is unchanging. He is a good, good father filled with compassion, leaning into the road, looking for your return or bidding you from the field. Come in because everything that I have is yours. His compassion compels us to earnestly. Seek him. His compassion compels him to earnestly seek you. I'm well out of time, and so I just want to share a poem with you that I wrote. That's right, big and sensitive. (laughs) A poem that I wrote with respect to this beautiful story. No matter how far we wander, No matter what gifts we squander, no matter how poorly we treat him, no matter how arrogantly we leave him, no matter how long it takes us, he waits for us patiently. He greets us compassionately. He loves us unconditionally. We are welcomed home. My heart for you today is that you would see the compassion of the Father and that it would compel you toward intimacy with him because there is nothing you can do, have done, will do, bad or good, that can magnify or minimize his compassion. He loves He loves because he is love, and he loves us into being lovable. Let's pray. Father.